Human beings are capable of horrifying, spine-chilling deeds. We've all heard the worst evils inflicted upon innocents, and every year a new case stuns us into silence, making us wonder if there's a line humans won't cross. In this series, we're going to look at disturbing real-life crimes. This is Cold-Blooded Crimes. Sada Abe was born into an upper-middle-class family in Tokyo on the 28th of May, 1905. Her father, Shigeyoshi Abe, inherited the family business of tatami mat-making. He was 52 when Sada was born. Sada was his seventh child with Sada's mother, Katsu Abe. Shigeyoshi and Katsu would go on to have eight children together, but only four would survive to adulthood, with Sada being one of them. Sada's parents strayed far from the vices that riddled Japan at the time. The police knew Shigeyoshi to be an honest and upright man, although he was a little egotistic, courtesy of his social standing. Katsu similarly had no criminal or immoral faults, but the same could not be said for their children. Sada's brother, Shintara, was a well-known womanizer, and once he got married, he stole his family's fortune and ran away. As for Sada's sister, Teruko, she was just as promiscuous. Her father resorted to sending her away to a brothel, which was a common punishment for women who were deemed sexually immoral. Her father later purchased her back, and due to the social standing of the family, Teruko was able to marry, despite her unseemly past. Sada's fate was grimmer than those of her siblings. Growing up her mother's favorite, Sada was encouraged to learn how to sing and play the shamisen, a three-stringed Japanese instrument. Although such endeavors would be regarded as artistic today, in Sada's time, these were practices mainly taken up by geishas and prostitutes. Geishas in particular were seen as celebrities back then. From a young age, Sada showed an interest in being a geisha herself. She skipped school and wore makeup, mimicking the geishas that absorbed the interest of Japanese society. While Sada's siblings caused trouble for her family, her parents would send her out of the house. Wandering about all alone, she started to mingle with crowds of independent teenagers. It was during one of these outings that Sada's tragedy began. At the tender age of 15, an acquaintance raped Sada. Her parents stood by her after that ordeal. For two years, they tried to support her as much as they could, but like her siblings, Sada became difficult. Not knowing what more to do with her, her father opted to send her to a geisha house in Yokohama in 1922. Toku Abe, another one of Sada's siblings, believed Sada wanted to become a geisha, but Sada saw things differently. Her father was punishing her for being promiscuous, the same way he had punished Toruko all those years ago. Sada became a low-ranking geisha since she hadn't enrolled in a geisha apprenticeship from childhood. Her skills in arts and music were also lacking. What's really sad is that low-ranking geishas were meant to sleep with men. That was their main duty. And after five years of trudging through such a miserable and disappointing life, Sada contracted syphilis. From then on, Sada had to be regularly examined. Things got worse after that, and by the early 1930s, Sada was working as a licensed prostitute in the famous Tabita brothel district, located in Osaka. Sada's reputation in the brothel district crumbled after she tried to steal money from clients and escape the system, only to be tracked down. It took two years to break free from the prostitution system. Her next job was waiting tables, but it didn't pay well, so she wound up prostituting herself again, except this time, she was an unlicensed prostitute. In 1933, her mother passed away, so Sada traveled back to Tokyo to visit her mother's grave and to see her father. She continued to work as an unlicensed prostitute while residing in Tokyo. Then, in 1934, her father fell seriously ill and died. Sada took care of him for 10 days until he took his final breath. After suffering one tragedy after another, the police raided the illegal brothel Sada worked at and arrested the workers there. Thankfully, the brothel owner had a well-connected friend, Kinosuke Kasahara, who managed to get the women released. In the process of freeing the unlicensed brothel workers, Kinosuke came across Sada and fell for her. He asked her to be his mistress, and she agreed. Kinosuke started to provide for Sada. He got her a home and took care of her upkeep. A few weeks into their relationship, Kinosuke was tired of Sada. Her sex drive was too high for him to handle, according to his own account and it was getting harder to satisfy her. 
Sada also had other plans up her sleeve and eventually asked Kinosuke to leave his wife and marry her. Kinosuke said no. And when Sada asked if she could take other lovers, she was met with the same answer, no. Sada ran away to Nagoya after that. Her escape kicked off a string of events that would culminate in a twisted and haunting crime of passion, one that would imprint itself on the psyche of Japanese culture for decades to come. Sada's dream to leave the sex industry never died. In 1935, she worked as a maid in a restaurant, hoping that her days as a prostitute were behind her. She also met Goro Omaya, a professor and banker with political aspirations. Sada and Goro developed feelings for each other, but knowing that it was against restaurant policy to enter into a relationship with a customer, and given how dull Nagoya was, Sada decided to return to Tokyo. While in Tokyo, Sada met Goro again, and they continued from where they left off. Sada had contracted syphilis again, so Goro paid for her to stay at a hot springs resort in Kusatsu between November 1935 and January 1936. Goro saw a lot in Sada and even spoke to her about how she may become financially independent. He suggested she run a restaurant, but since she would need experience for that, he told her to consider working as an apprentice to a restaurant owner first. One thing led to another, and Sada found work in a restaurant called Yoshidaya, which was owned by 42-year-old Kishizo Ishida. Kishizo had also worked his way up to this position. Earlier on in his career, he had worked as an apprentice at an eel restaurant. But the truth is, Kishizo had lost his taste for business. In truth, his wife ran Yoshidaya while he spent his time gallivanting. Given his record with women, it was no surprise that Kishizo started to seduce Sada. Sada was still romantically involved with Goro, but since Goro had failed to satisfy her sexually, she gave herself to Kishizo. By April 1936, Sada and Kishizo were already sleeping together. They had started their relationship off at the restaurant, where geishas frequently played romantic ballads. Sada and Kishizo then started to meet up at tea houses, which was a common practice for couples who wanted to meet away from prying eyes. The first time they went to a tea house together was on April 23rd. It was meant to be a short fling, but the couple ended up staying in bed together for four days. It seemed like Sada had finally met her match. After Kinosuke and Goro, she was finally with a man who could satisfy her appetite. After their first escapade, they went to another tea house in a distant neighborhood where they continued to make love even as maids entered the room to serve sake. They drank a lot together during that period. What's sad about this story is Kishizo had no way of knowing that at the end of this marathon of pleasure and debauchery was his death at the hands of Sada, who was falling deeply in love with him. On the 8th of May that year, Kishizo returned to work and his wife, who had been running the restaurant while he was away with Sada. History repeated itself, with Sada expecting Kishizo to leave his wife and be with her. She had become quite obsessive, and when she was rejected, dark thoughts took root in her mind. She was drinking excessively at the time, and after watching a play in which a geisha threatens her lover with a knife, she decided she would do the same. She sold some of her clothing to buy a knife, and a few days later, after they returned from their long escapade together, she confronted Kishizo with a knife. At first, Kishizu was startled, but it was clear he found the threat arousing. After that incident, when the couple secreted themselves away, they started to explore darker perversions in bed. Sada would strangle Kishizo while they were sleeping together, and Kishizo enjoyed this tremendously. She did this to him for two hours until his face wouldn't return to normal anymore. Sada gave Kishizo a sedative to ease the pain, but while Kishizo started to doze off, he told her, you'll put that cord around my neck and squeeze it again while I'm sleeping, won't you? If you start to strangle me, don't stop, because it is so painful afterward. Did Kishizo want to die? This isn't clear. Even Sada didn't know what to think. But two days later, while Ishida was asleep, Sada went ahead and strangled him to death. She then slept by his corpse for a few hours before dismembering his private parts. She then used Kishizo's blood to write Sada Kichi together on his left thigh. After that, she wrote her name on his left arm. The next morning, she left the inn and asked the workers not to interrupt Kishizo, who was exhausted and wanted to sleep. Later on, Sada met Goro, who she had betrayed over and over again while sleeping with Kishizo. She told him she was sorry, knowing full well that when she was caught for what she had done, his association with her 
would ruin his political career. Goro had no idea what Sada was apologizing for. A few days later, the media was swarming the public with news of Kishizo's death. The search for her was a grand event. On one occasion, a tip about her whereabouts led to a stampede and caused a traffic jam. While the authorities were looking for her, Sada spent her time drinking and writing letters. She planned to end her own life by jumping off Mount Ikoma. When the police finally caught up with her in the inn she had been staying at, she told them, don't be so formal. You're looking for Sada Abe, right? Well, that's me. I'm Sada Abe. She even showed them Kishizo's genitalia to prove she wasn't lying. During her interrogation, when a policeman asked her why she killed Kishizo, she said, I loved him so much. I wanted him all to myself, but since we were not husband and wife, as long as he lived, he could be embraced by other women. I knew that if I killed him, no other woman could ever touch him again. So I killed him. The police officer later recalled how her eyes lit up when she spoke about killing Kishizo so that no other woman could have him again. This aspect of her story was quite enduring, as many people couldn't ignore how much genuine love she seemed to have for Kishizo. In the end, Sada was convicted of second-degree murder and mutilation of a corpse. Although she wanted the death penalty, she ended up serving five years in prison. Upon her release, she assumed an alias for a while until she became a pop culture icon, a figure of sexual freedoms. The story inspired books, literature, plays, essays, and documentaries. Her effect on Japan was palpable. It isn't clear when Sada passed away, but she was over 66 at the time, and it was after her disappearance from the public eye in the 1970s. Towards the end of Sada's life, she was both a notorious killer and a symbol of freedom for oppressed women. Such was the effect of her story that her influence was debated heavily for decades. What are your thoughts? How should Sada be remembered in Japanese culture? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe for another video like this one.